Today, I want to talk about the future. There we are, the future. Uh, uh, and how we make the future, how it's shaped, and what curiosity has to do with that. Because they're actually really linked very tightly. So it may sound crazy to you guys, especially the ones that are all still in school. But once you're out of school, there are lots of classes and stuff you wish you had taken. And I've been exploring lots of these things through, uh, through uh, Coursera. And I do all kinds of random stuff, you know, from, from Egyptian pyramid stuff to you know, uh, Roman architecture. I got really into dinosaurs for a while and, and took every paleontology class that there was. And I learned these things about these mesosaurs. These are these giant, you know, marine reptiles. They were the badass reptiles. I mean, these things would be so cool if they were around. But thankfully, they're kind of not, actually. But uh, recently, Gothic cathedrals. Not as exciting as I had hoped. You know, a lot of church music, but they're kind of, it's okay. Uh, physics and, and things about California's ecology. All kinds of random stuff that don't seem to have any connections, but there are actually connections everywhere in this. So I made a bunch of discoveries. One of the discoveries I made was something that people know, and you learn about it in school, and you hear about it, but after taking all these dinosaur classes, I really understood it in, in a much more profound way. And that is that something like a lion, a mammal, um, is to a bat in exactly the same way that a Tyrannosaurus rex is to a chicken. Now, I know this sounds, I mean, we know this sort of intellectually, but you, know, you can imagine that if all the, the mammals on the planet died, except the avian mammals, which are the weird bat things, I mean, you know, that's all we got left, if those things were the only thing left, the same thing happened to the dinosaurs, and the only thing we have left are chickens. And it did change my opinion of chickens, because they are, they're really dinosaurs. They're the last of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs didn't go extinct. They just you know, became you know, nuggets. Uh, but <laughs> I also made a bunch of other discoveries. Uh, the Romans invented everything. Uh, this, is, this is my Roman architect, uh, 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 architecture class, the instructor. That was her first thing. She says, the Romans they invented everything first. Uh, and it is kind of true. They invented cement and basically paved roads, uh, water systems, running water baths. You know, when people go to the spa, they're going to something that the Romans invented ages and ages ago, thousands of years ago. Uh, the shopping mall. The shopping mall didn't exist until the Romans made it uh, in 49 AD, Hadrian's uh, Market, something like that. Uh, and, and these things thrived all over the empire, these shopping malls, as you might imagine, right? But I also have learned that progress isn't um, inevitable. It isn't something that happens accidentally. So Rome falls in you know, 476. It kind of declines for a while, and then like, finally you know, gets wiped out by the Visigoths. Uh, and this was bad. <laughs> uh, so all of these things that they invented, all of these great things, along with tons of other stuff that they built and, and systems that they had and agriculture that they had designed, they all fail. They all completely stop. The, the ability to build ports and roads and running water and everything. The thing that survived, though, was astrology, of all things. And this is something I just learned uh, literally two nights ago. I'm sitting in the chair, kind of half asleep, doing the Gothic you know, church class. And, and you know, the music is going, and it's talking about you know, divinity and stuff. And the stained glass windows in Chartres, and actually all of the cathedrals in Europe that were built in the 11 and 1200s, uh, and uh, up until the 16 or 1700s, have astrology. They have the Roman astrology all throughout the stained glass. Because for some reason, the civilization you know, went with astrology, kept that while forgetting how to make concrete and shopping malls, um, indoor plumbing. They went for a thousand years without indoor plumbing when Rome fell. And for you know, a thousand years, that's 40 generations. You know, that's not you know, your grandparents. That's your grandparents, grandparents, grandparents. None of them had running water anymore. They had. They'd had running water for 800 years. And then they forgot how to do it. They just you know, lost their imagination uh, and instead had some astrology. And that was the only thing that survived. So progress is not inevitable. You know, we make it by our curiosity, by making sure that the next year is actually more interesting than the previous one. So let's not do that again. That was really, really bad. And I think that if we tried to do that now, it would be catastrophic. There's lots of things that are potentially dangerous right now. And I think climate change and sort of resource limits 
are the things that most people think about at the moment. And about 15 years ago, a friend and I, Martin Eberhardt, we were really concerned about oil and, and its contribution to climate change. And some of you may know, we started Tesla Motors in 2003. And that, you know, we're making a small impact that actually electric cars are happening, and that's decarbonizing that part of the transportation structure. But more, inter more recently, I've been more involved in other things. And I've been looking at milk. And, you know, I like milk. I mean, milk's OK. <laughs> uh, I really like cheese, though. Uh, and, you know, I like pizza and things. And, you know, and cows are fine, too. They're pretty, you know, they're you know, kind of neat looking. And I made some discoveries. So in California, and I was just looking at California more recently, 100 million acres, we got, you know, 40 million people. And you would think that, you know, the state is the most populous state in the union. It's going to be really crowded. Well, it turns out that almost all of us live on 5% of the land. And if you think about it, you kind of know that's true because there's, there's San Francisco and there's, you know, L.A. and San Diego and, you know, maybe Sacramento. And then what, like Fresno? I mean, you know, you're down into nothing by, by that. So, so this is actually really exciting. It means that almost all of the state doesn't have people on it. Cows, though, take a surprising number. So there's 7 million cows. 1.7 million are in the dairy industry. And then the others are in the, you know, the beef industry. They be, you know, become hamburgers. Uh, uh, and that takes 38% of all the land mass of California. It's craziness. I mean, you know, uh, cows, right? 38%. So this is, there's just got to be a better way. And you think, well, there is, right? We have lots of different kinds of milk available now. Or milk, in quotes, air quotes, uh, air quotes. Um, you know, there's, there's almond milk and soy milk uh, and cashew milk. I'm particularly fond of, of, of almond milk. My favorite new one, though, is this new one called plant milk. It's like they don't even know what they put in it. It's like, you know, you know the yard clippings, they just made milk out of it somehow. Uh, but these are not real milks. And you know that that's true in your heart of hearts because you can't make cheese out of them. Uh, if you've ever had like vegan cheese, it's not actually, I don't even know what, it's, it's a whole different thing and it's just kind of weird. But it's not cheese. You can't make pizza out of it that is any good, right? So this is crucial. And I'm a big believer that if something is going to replace something else in the society, if we're, going to, if we're going to make a societal change to, you know, help the environment, let's say, or to make us more healthy, it has to be better. And not having cheese isn't going to fly. It's just, just not going to work. So as I've been investigating this more, I've discovered that there are lots of companies working on this. And my favorite approach is what I call cow in a vat. And I mean, they don't put the cow in the vat, but they put the parts of the cow that are interesting. And those are the parts that make the, the milk proteins that, that we like, that we, that we drink, and that, we, that make cheese. They use you know, CRISPR and all kinds of fancy DNA technology to program microorganisms to generate, those, to, to generate the, the plant protein, or the uh, milk proteins. So the idea is you actually make cow's milk. And that cow's milk can, of course, make cheese and everything else, but there's no cow involved. And this same approach is applied to all kinds of different things. So, you know, Finless Foods is working on doing that with fish. So they're building fish proteins and then trying to build, you know, salmon steaks, basically, without ever having the salmon around, just the, just the meat. Uh, the same, and, and of course, many people are familiar with Impossible Foods here in the Bay Area. Uh, they are using genetically engineered organisms to create the heme, which is, you know, essentially the, the, the stuff that makes blood interesting. And, and they put that in their veggie burgers so that when you, when you cut open an Impossible Burger, it bleeds. And, you know, I think if you're a vegetarian, it's a little creepy, um, but it does taste really good. And so this kind of thing is really important and really huge. They, these people are pushing the boundaries of what we think of as the food systems. And that can reinvent the whole way we do agriculture and reinvent California, I think. Because imagine if we were to rewild that 38%. Imagine a future in which we take literally almost 40% of California and we make it like some really cool park. You know, and we keep some of the cities the way they are, but instead of having these cow pastures, they're like some really neat critters there. It could be a much more fun future, a much more interesting future. And perhaps, as one of, in the little bio, you know, de-extinction is something that a, a acquaintance of mine, a friend of mine, uh, is really into. 
And, and he's working on a bunch of different projects in de-extinction, and one of them is the woolly mammoth. And I just think it would be just so awesome to be you know, <laughs> driving down the road and one of these things is going around uh, in California, because they, were, they used to be here. And it's, the evidence is that we likely killed them all. You know, the, the habitation when humans are... Woolly mammoths were around for a million years. They went through all kinds of different climate cycles. And, you know, 5,000 years after a human arrives, they're all extinct. I just can't believe that was an accident. Say, oh, climate change got them. I think the hunters got them. We were, we're really good at hunting things. So I think we can bring them back. And we can bring them back where the cows are, because we need something like a cow to, to keep the grasses down. So I think that's the way to do it. So adaption and technology, I think, is going to be the future. And that's all based on our curiosity about how these systems work. So some of you may remember Hurricane Michael in 2018. And this storm was super interesting for a lot of reasons. It was terrible. It killed 72 people. So this was not, you know, it's not a fun thing, but it's really interesting. So this is coming into the Florida panhandle in a place in Florida where they've never had a hurricane before. They've had tropical storms. They've never had a hurricane. And the thing that made it so deadly and so, so destructive was this rapid intensification. So it went from a tropical depression to a category four hurricane in like three days. And the last 36 hours, it went from category two to category four, which is unheard of. And it did that because the Gulf waters were warmer than they've ever been. And a hurricane gets its energy, it gets its rotational speed, it gets its danger and its, its, its uh, destructive power from the heat of the water. It spins it up, the physics of that is what drives it. And we know why the ocean was this warm. This wasn't some kind of weird accident. It's because for this century, as the world has been heated by our CO2 increases in the atmosphere, that heat has been in the oceans mainly because the thermal mass of the ocean is just enormous. So that is, the oceans are much warmer than they used to be. And that is why that, that hurricane came up. So these two guys, uh, they're actually, the older guy's the uncle, that's the nephew. Uh, and they decided to build a house in Mexico Beach, Florida, which was the where the target was, or where the hurricane hit. And when they were building it, only about two years ago, they, the architect is, gave him a design and said, you know, we're really worried about climate change. We're really thinking about that. And although there's never been a hurricane like that ever to hit this area, you know, the water's getting warmer, and we think that that could really happen. So we want you to build the house not like you, not to code, not to the way it's normally built, but we want you to build it so it can withstand a hurricane, a big hurricane, like a hurricane like there's never been in that panhandle before. And we know how to do that. So they built this house. This whole, that was Mexico Beach, Florida. 72 people killed, the whole place destroyed. The only damage that their house had was the little window at one of the bathrooms was cracked by something that must have hit it that came through. The winds were 150 miles an hour that went through this, this area. And there's a staircase that comes up to the second floor that was designed to break away. If the flood surge came in and tried to wipe out, which they took out, I mean, even the foundations barely survived of most of these houses. But the, he, the, the architect had put together a, a detachable staircase that would break away instead of, you know, kind of tearing the house apart. So a few thousand dollars later, their house is completely fine. They had no, essentially no damage. And this to me is very hopeful because it means you know, if you're interested in what's happening, if you follow along, if you, this is a little piece of the future that they shaped. And, you know, if all of these houses get rebuilt in a very similar way, the next time a Category 4 hurricane hits, we'll read about some insurance claims against it. There won't be 72 people who died. There won't be this kind of devastation. So, again, this idea of thinking about things and moving into the future is really, really important. And this is a quote where he says, you know, I think the storms are going to get stronger. You know, the climate models don't look good for this area. We had better think about it. Think about the future we're going to make. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of things. My talk is very short, but I'm hoping it, you know, is thought-provoking, cultivates curiosity. We made the world the way it is. Humans have touched every piece of this planet. There is nothing natural left. People say... Um, you know, oh, 
uh, I only eat natural stuff. And they're sitting there with, you know, broccoli and kale and all kinds of the fruits and vegetables that you buy at the supermarket, none of which are natural. Broccoli and kale and uh, cauliflower and there's a couple others. We made those in the last few hundred years out of mustard seed, out of mustard plants. That's what they are. You know, we, we made everything. We made everything from the energy systems, the agricultural systems, the economic systems of, of you know, who gets what. The world is the way it is, not because it's somehow magically the way it is. It is the way it is because we built it that way. Now, it may be we didn't intend on things to come out the way they did. I think that that is really true. But, you know, humans created these systems. And we also are going to make the future. And, you know, you have this, especially young people, you say, oh, you are the future. Well, it's not actually true at all. You're going to kind of live in the future. But, but you know, just by definition, one hopes you're going to be living in the future. Uh, but you don't, you make the future by your actions and by your intent and what things that you, you, you build and desire and, and design. So progress is not, you know, a con inevitable. You know, 40 generations didn't have running water in Rome because they just lacked the imagination to think about how it is we can make the world better tomorrow. You know, what kind of world do we want to live in? We want to live in exactly the same world, but I'm a Pisces, it's all okay. You know, like that, for 40 generations they did that, a thousand years. And we don't want to do that again. We literally will the future into existence by our actions. So let's really think about the kind of world we want to create. And not everyone's going to agree. I mean, I kind of want woolly mammoths walking around California. But maybe that freaks people out, and they don't want that. And we go, well, we'll negotiate. You know, maybe I can have my little woolly mammoth somewhere. And you, you know, but, but we really want to be thoughtful about the future. But make sure that it happens. Because if always we're just doing the same thing we always do. You know, Kevin Thrace was here and said, you know, the AI tools are going to really amplify our abilities and allow us to do things in a very different way. And perhaps, you know, maybe we're just going to be all emotive and not really be, you know, intellectual. I'm not entirely sure of that. But what I do know is that we're going to create a really interesting future if we work at it. And I think we've never had much as powerful tools as we do now. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. Just think about the world you want to make because you're going to actually do it unless you just kind of lay there. So you don't want to do that. Thank you.